the biblical text is not compatible with the standard uh, the conventional paradigm. Uh, you cannot, you can't put the two together. Uh, you can't do it. And my research showing that this is actually a historical narrative means that they, they can't do it. It's, it's not poetry. It's not, it's not um, uh, statistically admissible. Uh, it was with an uh, ICR sponsored project um, called the RAPE Project, which stands for Radio Isotopes in the Age of Europe. And they let this uh, Hebraist in with, it, with all the geologists, the physicists, these brilliant yeah. geologists, physicists. And but what I wanted to do was uh, to uh, quantify uh, people. Let's say Hebraist <laughs> know intuitively, <laughs> um, but can we prove it? Can we can, can we do it uh, uh, mathematically, or statistically? So what I uh, what I did was I worked with a, uh, two statisticians. I counted the number of a particular verb type called a viacol. It forms the backbone of Hebrew narrative, okay? And so I counted the number in uh, all of the passages. I went through all the passages of the Hebrew Old Testament. I identified which passages were, uh, they considered to be a, a narrative with the poetry. Uh, and then uh, the statistician, uh, he picked random, random number generator, which, which ones I would analyze. Mm -hmm. I counted the number of uh, viacols. Uh, in each passage, and we showed statistically that uh, as you moved from poetry to narrative, that the, the number of vehicles went way up, so like about 50%, and the other direction it was down 4% or something like that. And then my question is, could you use this uh, in some way to predict, based upon the number of vehicles, whether a passage was poetry or narrative? We did it at, at, at a 99.5% uh, confidence level. Um, but it turned out that the, the difference between narrative and poetry is so great that the, the band of all the possible logistic regression curves is very actually quite narrow. And as a result, looking just at Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, the probability that it is narrative is between 0.999942 and 0 0.999987. Well, that's you know, so, so that means it is that's narrative, and then once you realize that the biblical narrators also believed it was history, uh, and presented as history, and then we believe as Mayor Sternberg, who's Jewish, recognizes that uh, he he pointed out he says you know you Christians uh, believe in inspiration, and so if the authors of the Bible are believe that they are writing real history and presenting as real history, then. Uh, as believers' inspiration, you must believe that it's real history. Great website, by the way, uh, is Genesis History. I would recommend it to everybody. A lot of great stuff in there. Um, a lot more scientific than, than most people think. It's, I got some great stuff there. And we're doing that because we're starting a new series today. Uh, I'm calling a thematic overview of Genesis 1 through 12. And we'll look at a lot of different su subjects, a lot of different topics. There will be some exposition, of course. Uh, but we're going to look at themes in these chapters. So today, of course, is part one. We're going to do the introduction. We're going to look at God as the creator and why that's important. So in this series, we're going to talk a lot about, uh, of course, creation, but we're going to look at dinosaurs, humans, marriage, sexuality, sin, the ark, the flood, science, the Abrahamic covenant, and much, much more. So each lesson is going to be kind of a, a systematic theology, so to speak. Short, <clears throat> of course. And I'm hoping to answer some of the questions that have arisen within the body of Christ when it comes to science and the Bible and things like that, too. Now, as you see here, of course, we can't cover everything. Uh, we would be here for about 3,000 years, um, but I don't have that much time. I don't know about you, but that's just not tenable. Um, can't answer every question, but my goal is to help those of us who are here, those who are watching, those who listen, to develop a biblical worldview. We desperately need this in the body of Christ today. Based upon these uh, first 12 chapters, as they do answer many questions that people ask. Now, before we get to the study... I want to do just a kind of a brief overview of Genesis itself. So you have that in, the, in your bulletins and your outlines there. And just a little bit about Genesis. It is the book of beginnings. We've got the beginning of creation, the beginning of humanity, the beginning of animals and sin, marriage and uh, death, languages, the beginning of culture, the beginning of government. 
the beginning of the nation of Israel, and more. You know, while there are various views uh, with it when it comes to Genesis, when it comes to the writer and the time frame, um, I do hold to what I believe is the biblical view, um, the, basically the, the classic view, that this was written by Moses about 1445 or so BC, after the Israelites were freed from Egypt and on their way to the Promised Land. Genesis to Deuteronomy are called the books of Moses in the Bible. And there's a reason for that, because they viewed them as written by Moses. So, I mean, it's really not rocket science, although some people try to make it a lot more complicated than it is. And he was guided and inspired by God to write down Genesis through Deuteronomy, and of course, uh, one of the Psalms as well. And when Moses wrote this, he wrote this before they went into the promised land of Canaan. And that determines some of the topics that he actually chose to talk about. And we'll look at some of those as we go along, Lord willing. But once you get to chapter 12 of Genesis, the text focuses in on the patriarchs, the fathers, the leaders of the nation of Israel. Their victories, their faith, their failures, their lack of faith. And that's a transition to the book of Exodus, of course, where we're introduced to the man named Moses. And these early chapters in Genesis, as you saw in the video, they are not poetic. Moses wrote these as historical narrative. Now there's structure, and we'll look at some of that, Lord willing, next time. But this is a literal historical event that God wants us to know about when it comes to creation and other things that follow after that. Now here's a brief outline of Genesis. <clears throat> Very basic. We have the creation, Genesis 1 and 2. We have what's called the fall in Genesis 3. Genesis 4 and 5 is basically the family of Adam and Eve. Then 6 through 9, we have the worldwide flood, Noah. Then 10 and 11, we have the nations where they dispersed, and then the Tower of Babel. Very important topic, actually. Then 12 through 25, we have Father Abraham. Then chapter 26 to 27, verse 45, we have Isaac, just a few chapters for him. And then 27, 46 through 36, 43, we have Jacob. And then the rest of the book of Genesis, 37 through 50, is about one man named Joseph. Amazing how he gets so much text. Well, he should. He's a type of Christ. He's a type of Christ in many ways. <coughs> so there's just kind of a brief overview of the book of Genesis itself. But with that understanding, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. So please stand as we read these two verses. And this will be the foundation for our study today. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Again, our God and Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for those who are here, those who are watching, those who are listening, even later. Pray, Father, for your spirit also to move among us, to change us, to teach us, to equip us, to strengthen us, and to empower us, Lord, to be the Christians you called us to be. May you also work in the lives of those who don't know you and draw them to Christ. For your glory we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. These are the first two verses in the Bible. Again, very familiar to many of us. They truly are profound when you consider the context and we'll look a little bit at that here in a little bit. Now, one thing that's very common in Hebrew writing was a summary and then details. And that's partly what's actually going on here. You have a general statement in verse 1, and then Moses goes back and fills in the details. Basic statement in the beginning. Beginning of what? Well, the beginning of time as we know it. God did something. Well, what did he do? He created the heavens and the earth. Well, how did he do that? Well, verse 2 and going on from there actually starts telling us how he did it. And gives the details. And as we look at this, the Bible actually begins with the declaration that there is one God. Now, the Hebrew word for God here is Elohim. Can you say that? Elohim. You have to have that in there, by the way, because that's, that's just the, that's the, the way the, the Hebrews would speak. This is actually a plural word. El is singular. The I am at the end makes it plural. 
But when the Bible speaks of God, we know that he's one God revealed as a complex unity or trinity or triunity. Again, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, some would say that Elohim refers to God's plurality of majesty. Others will say, well, it's an actual kind of a veiled reference to the triune nature of God. I think it's both. I think it's both. Because we have two members here mentioned in the first two verses. We have the Father, we have the Spirit. Mentioned in verses 1 and 2. So the Godhead is there, though not directly referred to as we would think of it. But, of course, each member of the Godhead has majesty, has glory. Jesus even prayed that before he was crucified. You know, give me the glory that I have with you before the foundation of the world. So they do have majesty and glory. Now, we as Christians believe in one God. We do not believe in three gods. We don't believe in millions of gods like Hindus do. The belief in one God is known as monotheism. Mono is one, theism is, is a God. It's a basic reference. Uh, we also do not believe in three modes or manifestations of God. That's a dangerous doctrine that's being promoted. This God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Isaiah, Micah, John the Baptist, the quote Father, Jesus as the Son of God, Paul, and others in the Bible. But here's a question. The Bible speaks of other gods. Why is that? Why does the Bible talk about these other beings, these other deities? <clears throat> well, it's a good question. And we need to understand a couple of things about the ancient Near East, or the A.N.E. In the ancient Near East, <clears throat> when the scripture was written, particularly the Old Testament, <clears throat> it was accepted that there were other gods and deities that existed. That's just the way the culture was. This is known as henotheism. It's hard for us to grasp as Christians. But this is the way it was, again. And you move to another country, you go to even India today. It's the same thing. They believe in multiple gods. Now, let me ask you this. What are some of the pagan gods mentioned in Scripture? I want you to think here. Name some of those pagan gods in the Bible. See if you can remember some. What are a few of them? You remember? Baal. Baal, yep. Baal or Baal. What else? There's actually quite a few. <clears throat> the Old and New Testament. Marduk is mentioned. Remember Dagon in the Philistines, the one that fell over, had his you know, hands chopped off and his head fell off? That was a fish guy, by the way. And in the book of Acts, so great is Diana of the Ephesians. That disgusting multi-breasted statue they worshipped. They said came from the sky. Scripture speaks of these other deities, these other beings, particularly in the Old Testament, as if they are real. Well, we know that they're not real in the sense that they're actually demons worshipped as gods. It's a deception of Satan. They don't really exist, and even the Old Testament does speak to that. But they were written as if they were real because that was what the people worshipped. That was the culture of the day. And <clears throat> historically, and in other parts of the world today, there are many cultures that still believe in a multitude of gods. And by the way, in America, we also believe in a multitude of gods. We just don't call them deities. We call them materialism and other things, too. We worship sports. We worship work. We worship a lot of other things other than God, which are idols, too, even in the church. Hinduism, I mentioned. Native American folk religion. Ancestor worship. Other false religions believe in a multitude of gods or spirits, even to this day. And again, historically, and in some places, even today, these are viewed as local deities. Well, what is that? Well, they live on this mountain. They live on that mountain. They live in the plains. They live in the water. You know, they're in the desert. They're in the sky. They're in the trees and the rocks. You know, we have to appease these gods somehow. They live in the animals. You know, don't, don't kill that animal and eat it because there's, there's, there's a God in there. We can't hurt it. You know, maybe, you know, your great, 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 great uncle. So we have to worship it and appease it. Now, we may think that's strange, but if you live in that culture, they take that very seriously. And that's one reason why there's so many problems when it comes to starvation, malnutrition, and things like that. 
They could have food, but they worship the food instead of eating. And it's sad. It's very sad. I mean, places like Africa, Asia, Haiti. Ever hear hoodoo? Mm -hmm. That's a belief in multiple gods or spirits or deities. And more so, I mean, this stuff is still around even to this day. And the Israelites, of course, lived in that culture. Now, where did they live before they came out to the Promised Land? Where were they? Egypt. Egypt. For quite a while. And the Israelites came out of Egyptian bondage, and there were numerous gods worshipped in Egypt. I mean, we, most of us have studied mythology of some kind, you know, with the Greek gods and the, you know, the pantheon of the, those deities, which actually became the Roman gods with different names. <laughs> <clears throat> But in Egypt, there were multiple gods aside from the Pharaoh himself. And while there were some Israelites who still believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and cried out to him, they were exposed to, and even to an extent, some embraced those basic, uh, horrible pagan worship practices. Well, how do we know that? Well, remember what happened in Exodus 32? This little thing about a golden calf, that was a, a god in Egypt. And actually was one of the deities that was worshipped in other cultures too. And different forms of this ox were used. Sometimes a god was riding on the beast. Sometimes it was representative of a god. So it was something that they had seen multiple times, I'm sure. And what do they do? Well, hey, behold, this is your god who brought you out of Egypt. <clears throat> so in Exodus 32 while Moses was actually at Mount Sinai receiving the law the Ten Commandments and more the Israelites were worshipping this golden calf in a pretty grotesque way as well and they learned that in Egypt God took the people out of Egypt but it was hard to take the Egypt out of the people. It took time. And one of the reasons that we find these things, particularly in the Mosaic Law, is because once the Israelites got to the Promised Land, what was one of the biggest struggles they had? Worshipping idols. After the Babylonian captivity, that changed in some ways. But one of the biggest problems that the Israelites had was to go to these false deities, you know, again, Baal and, and other ones, and worship and bow down to them and offer sacrifices to them, uh, asking for help and for hope and for uh, blessings on crops and things like that. And sadly, in many ways, the church does the same thing today. We look to other things and other people and other ideas other than God to bless his people. We seek these fads, we seek what's popular, we seek this, we seek that, we want this, we want this, we want that, we want this experience, we want this deep intellectual thing, which may or may not be good, the same with other, everything else, may or may not be good, rather than seeking the Lord, rather than asking him, rather than praising him, Rather than worshiping him, rather than repenting to him and praying to him. Because he is the true and living God. Every other so called deity or idol that we worship is false. And one of the reasons that God has us go through the difficulties, as we saw in the series, is to break those idols away from our lives and to break those idols away from the church. And God, through Moses, declared that he alone is the one true and living God. All others are idols, the works of man's hands. Let's look at a few verses here. Psalm 115, verse 4. And their idols are silver and gold, <clears throat> the work of human's hands. Psalm 135, 15. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They created them themselves, that is. Here's some more. Revelation 9.20, going to the New Testament. This is referring to the end times. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up, what? 
worshiping demons. Tells you a little bit what it's going to be like in the future. Starting in the present. And idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone, stone and wood which cannot see or hear or walk. There's some more. Psalm 19, 1 and 2. We sang about this. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. And night to night reveals knowledge. What about the prophets? Isaiah. Chapter 40, verse 28 for one example. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord, Yahweh, is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Or Revelation 4.11. Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things. And by your will, by your power, they existed and were created. All these verses declare that God's a creator. The other idols are false, fake, and do not exist as deities. Here's a few more. John 1 and Colossians 1 both declare that Jesus is the creator as well. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. John is actually going back to Genesis 1 and linking these two together. Back to verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing, was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn that is preeminent of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. One of the greatest texts about the deity of Christ. Because he is the creator. So when it comes to Jesus, it means he is God. The Father, Son, and Spirit were involved in creation. They're also involved in salvation today. And we'll be involved in recreation at the end of the age when Christ returns. So this is the God who has revealed himself in creation. Revealed himself in scripture. Revealed himself in our conscience. And of course revealed himself in the word of God. He is active in history. His creation is complete. But he is involved. But who is this God? Let's look a little bit at Exodus 34. Now, I do have the text up here, but if you want to turn there or click there, you can do that, Exodus chapter 34. We'll look a little bit more as God is expressing himself and telling us about himself in his word. While we can learn a lot from creation, there is limited knowledge of him in creation. And you can go back to Romans 1, which we've talked about before, too. Exodus 34, 1 through 8. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, because he had already broken the other ones, remember, with the, with the idolatry in chapter 32. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai, and, and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he arose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai. As the Lord had commanded him, he took in his hand two tablets of stone. Now, by the way, these would have been small tablets. They were not the giant stones that you see in the movies and stuff. That's not the culture of the day. That's not what the covenant would have been on. They probably would have been about this size. They would have been written on both sides, two copies, one for the Israelites and one for God, which went into the Ark of the Covenant. So it's kind of a little bit more of the culture there in that day. So the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, verse 5, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, 
The Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head to the earth and worshiped. Hmm. There's a lot in here about who God is. We're talking about him as the creator. And scripture does talk about that a lot, and we'll look at that here in a minute. But here we have what God is describing about himself. He's merciful. He's full of mercy. He's gracious. He's full of grace. He's also very patient. Aren't you glad? Mm -hmm. I know I am. He should have squished me, I don't know how many times, but this time in my life. <laughs> Slow to anger. Abounding in steadfast or covenant-keeping love and faithfulness. And keeping steadfast or covenant-keeping love for thousands. And what else does he do? He forgives. He's a forgiving God. But he's also holy and just. And for those who don't repent, he will not clear them of their guilt. So as the Lord is working in our lives, these are the character qualities he's working in us to. Because we look at Jesus, we see the same thing. Because he's God. Remember what he said? You've seen me, you've seen the Father. The way Jesus acted, the way he portrayed himself, the way he dealt with people, both those who were for him and those who were against him. Who is more merciful and gracious and patient and just and holy and even wrathful, but forgiving too? So as we look at these character qualities, I have to ask myself, and we need to ask ourselves, how are we doing? How are we doing? I don't measure up, but you know what? Christ does, and he did it for me. So what I cannot do, he did in my place. And when I trusted in him, he fulfilled these, but he's still working these things in me, in my life, and will continue to do so until I die and until you die. Or the Lord returns. This is the God who sent his son to take on human flesh, to die in our place, to be buried and physically resurrected three days later. This is the God we can know by faith because of his grace. And this among many passages describe who he is. Again, he's merciful, gracious, patient, abounding in covenant-keeping love and faithfulness, keeping that love, forgiving others, just, doesn't clear those who are guilty, doesn't matter what you look like, where you come from, how much you have or you don't have. If you're guilty, you're guilty. If you're innocent, you're innocent. He is just and judge. Now, the last part of these verses I want to deal with for just a minute. This regards the visiting of the iniquity on you know, thousands and, and everything else. That's actually tripped up many people and has taken a lot out of context. We did address this in our Sunday school, talking about discernment. But I want to go over this again just real quick because I think it's extremely important. Because when it says that in verse 7, it's actually a Hebrew figure of speech. It's a contrast contrast of God's abounding love towards thousands by forgiving their transgression and sin and his judgment on the third and fourth generation or the limitations of his discipline. Again, this has nothing to do with generational curses as we hear about it today. Now, yes, there are consequences to our sin with our families and everything like that, uh, but this is also part of the covenantal curse that God gave in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Verses 4 through 6. Because as you read in the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, God says something to the effect, well, because you did this, I'm going to do this. 
Because you rejected me, I'm going to judge you. Because you chose idols, fine, have it your way for a while. And then I'm going to judge you for it. The idea is that while God is the judge, he is more than willing to forgive, more than willing to express his grace, more than willing to express his love for those who turn to him. That's the idea behind those verses. So don't get trapped in some kind of false, legalistic, um, nonsensical teaching that says, oh, if you don't do this, you're going to be cursed for generations to come. That is absolutely not true. That is error. And it's also manipulation, by the way, too. And you'll see a lot on TV. So this is God the Creator who we can know. But what about some implications? What are some of the implications of the fact that God is the Creator? Let's look at a few of these. First of all, we are accountable to Him. Everyone. No matter who you are, how much you have or don't have, how educated you are or not, whatever language you speak, whatever country you live in, whatever skin tone you have, whether you have a big house, whether you live in a tent or a shack somewhere in the woods, you are accountable to God for your life, for your actions, for your attitudes for what you do and for what you don't do that you should have done. And for what we should not do and we end up doing. He gave you and I life. Remember, the text says, he knit us together in our mother's womb. We rejoice in that and we're grateful for that. We know that life begins at conception. But what does that mean? That means, okay, well, that means I'm accountable to him. And so are you. Now, thankfully for those of us in Christ, he took our punishment for us. He took death for us. But we're still accountable as Christians, too. By the way. Every human being has common grace. He gave you breath, and he's given you all you have. No, I, I did this by the sweat of my brow, by the strength of my own hand, by my own intelligence and my education. I did this. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Who gave you the breath in your lungs? Who allows your heart to beat? Who allows your mind to think? All God would have to do is just take his hands off and everything that we think of as reality in the universe would be gone. This is the God who spoke the universe into existence. He created it, he sustains it, and he will recreate it again one day. We owe him everything. And wherever we are, we need to recognize that. You owe him and I owe him. And we are accountable to him for all that we are and all that we do and say. In this life and in the next, our relationship with him, whether as an enemy or his child, determines and dictates everything. No one is born as a Christian. You have to be born again to become a Christian. That's the reality. And God has given so much knowledge of himself and we suppress that more and more and more and more. And we think that someone else or something else can save us. Government's not going to save you. No matter what government you're under. I guarantee you politicians are not going to save you. No matter what party you are. Or not. <laughs> Your education cannot save you. Your big house cannot save you. Your wisdom, your power, your strength cannot save you. Your works cannot save you. Only the God of the universe who sent his son to die in our place and save us. Talked about this last time a little bit. There's one certain 
100% surefire way to go to heaven, and that's only through Jesus and belief in him. But we are all accountable to him. And those without Christ, as Lord and Savior of their lives, you will pay for your sin eternally in the lake of fire. Under God's wrath, under his justice, and under his judgment. But those of us who know Jesus personally, we've had our sins completely forgiven, washed clean, whiter than the walls here. Amazing. White as snow. Because of his grace through faith in Jesus alone. We will be with him forever and we will see him face to face. <coughs> Christian, your sin was placed on Jesus. He paid the price for you. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever lose the wonder of that truth. And God has declared you and me righteous in him. He's declared us not guilty. He has restored our honor, though we dishonored him. Now, he has given us responsibilities, and we're to tell others about God as the creator. And we're still accountable to him, too. To love, to follow, to honor, to praise, to worship, to give, to be involved, to worship according to the standards which he's given to us in his word. Not for salvation, but from salvation. And yes, for the rewards too that we will receive because of our faithfulness. And we look to him because he's faithful to us too. So, first of all, we are all accountable to him. Second, we serve him. He does not serve us. Many believe that God is their servant. That if I believe enough, declare enough, speak enough, God's going to do it. God is not your servant. You're his. He's not your slave. You're his. He's not your child. You are his child. There's a reason we call him father. Yes, we trust in the Lord. We trust that we have faith that he can do anything according to his word. We trust that he can do those things. We walk by faith, not by sight. We also trust that he knows best. And that he will glorify himself. But he's not our slave. We're his. He's not our servant. We're his. Here's the thing. When we think God serves us in the sense that we can tell him to do anything we want and he'll do it. In an unbiblical way. We put ourselves in the place of God and make him to be lower than us. And that is idolatry. That is blasphemy. It's a false God. <laughs> and when we do pray to him, here's a question. Do we have faith that he will answer us? It may not be the answer we want, but do we trust that he will answer us according to his will? Because sometimes he doesn't do what we want because he's confronting our misunderstanding of his character. Now there are times he delights to do the things that we desire. Like any father would, any good father would. But we don't demand anything of God. So be careful of that in your life. Whether you're here, you're watching, whether you go to another church or not, be careful of that. It's a very popular idea. It's a very false idea too. But we serve him, he does not serve us. Number three. He is the first, he has the first and final say so in what happens in his universe. Because he's the creator. He created everything in six literal days. He's the originator of the cosmos. He's a sustainer of the cosmos. And he's the reformer of the cosmos, which I mentioned just a few minutes ago. He's told us what's going to take place in the end times. He told us what's going to happen in the future. And what do we know? He wins. 
God wins in the end. <clears throat> he will make all things right that are wrong today. He will bring about the justice that is true justice that needs to be done. Now this is encouraging for us when we feel like we've been treated in an unjust way or a wrong, wrong way. When we feel like we've got the wrong end of the stick, so to speak. You know, when we feel like we've been taken advantage of or abused. And maybe yeah, maybe so. It happens a lot in the world. There's a lot of abuse in the world. But to know that God's going to have the final say-so as to what happens is an encouragement to us. Because he will make all things right. And even make it better in the end. Number four. We should turn to him and trust him. We should turn to him and trust him. Easy application here. Because he is the creator and we're accountable to him and he has a first and final say so in what happens. We should run to him, embrace Christ as Lord, trust him and trust his word and know him by faith. That is the only logical response, the only biblical response to understanding who he is as the creator. That's the response he wants from us too. And that is the response that is best for us. What are the alternatives? Think about that. Trust in ourselves? How's that going? Good. <laughs> yeah. Trust in your bank account? How's that going? Trust in your job. <laughs> Trust in your education. Now, all these things have their place, don't get me wrong. And it's sad to say, trust in family and friends sometimes is very disappointing as well. So are we trusting him? Not just as individuals and as but as a church too. Important question today. We should turn to him and trust him. Number five, we should worship him. We should worship him. After embracing Christ as Lord, we should worship him. Now, this is more than singing. We've gone over this before, but I want to reiterate this. It's living for him on a daily basis. Whatever you do, whatever you eat or drink, do so for the glory of God, Paul said. That's the result of God's proclamation of his character. Remember Exodus 34, 8 for Moses? After declaring his character, God, God declaring his character, what was Moses' response? He bowed his head and he worshipped. That's the only response to understanding who he is. What happened to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6? I saw the Lord high and lifted up. What, was, what happened? He was broken. He repented. And he, Lord, send me. <clears throat> he was willing. You know, what happened when the majesty and glory of Christ seeped through his skin at the Mount of Transfiguration? Lord, let's stay here. Let's set up the tabernacles. Let's set up the kingdom. We're ready. You know, when they saw Jesus do his miracles, what manner of man is this? Even the waves and the sea obey him. We're having a problem with it. Creation doesn't have a problem with it. When we truly understand who God is, the only thing we can do is worship Him. And if we're not worshiping Him, why not? Why don't we have a passion for God? Why don't we sing? Even if we don't know the song, try it. We sang a new song today. Let's see the folks trying it out. <laughs> But it, it really does concern me when I see people not singing up here. It grieves me. Now, I know some people you know, may not know the song, like I said, or may not like to sing. That's up to them. But you're missing out. You're missing out. You really are. Because here's the question. If we're not singing to him, why not? Isn't he worthy of our praise? Isn't he worthy of our worship? 
Isn't he worthy of the time to give to him on a weekly basis? Uh-oh. <laughs> Little one's breaking in. And another thing, too, is, is being thankful. That's one reason why we worship him, too, because he is faithful, as we saw in, in the text. Why aren't our hearts bursting with praise towards him? Now, I know that sometimes it's hard. I know that life can be tough. We just did a series on that, you know, mostly during the lockdown. You can go back and look at that online now. All the videos are on, on Facebook. And I've been putting them on my YouTube channel, too. So two different places. But living a life that honors Him on a daily basis because of His grace, because we're thankful to Him for His faithfulness, we should worship Him. So God is the Creator. And this is extremely important when it comes to Scripture. You find it over and over again, as we saw in some of those verses, and there's a lot more besides that. But well, why is that? Well, because he's God. And in this first message in our series, we just did a brief introduction of Genesis, and the reality of what the Bible declares. What is that? That there's one God, and he is the creator. And the result of that is for those who wonder if God cares, the answer is a resounding yes. He does care for you. He does love you. But he's also angry with the wicked every day, the Bible says. And you're already under the wrath of God if you don't know him, even though he loves you. For those who wonder if you will ever intervene in history, in, in your country, in our life, or your life, the answer is yes. He will. And he has. Not the way he necessarily did it in the Bible. But his intervention is based on his plan, his purpose, not ours. And again, his plan, not ours. His timing, not ours. His ways, not ours. So we don't lose heart. And I have a question for those of us who are Christians. A challenge too. We know that God is more concerned about our hearts than anything else. About our character. But what is our physical posture in private and in public when we pray to him and when we praise him? How often, if we're able, I know some people can't do it, do we get on our knees and pray to him or praise him? There's just something about that physical posture when we pray or when we praise him that really does impact our prayer and praise. Again, we can pray and praise Him anywhere, you know, on the road, you know, at school, at work, whatever. We know that. It's not just a Sunday morning thing. But I challenge you, this week, at least once a day, if you're able to do so, get on your knees and pray to the Lord. Get on your knees and praise Him. Maybe just for a few minutes. And ask Him to help you see how that humble posture can really, really impact your life. And if you want to go even further, do what Moses did, put your face to the ground. That's actually what the Hebrew word for worship is. You lay down, prostrate before the deity, before God. And it's very humbling when you do that. Also, too, when it comes to the fact that God is a creator, He knows you. He knows you and 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 me. He knows what we go through. He knows what we struggle with. He knows what our heartaches are. He knows what our victories are. He also knows our miserable failures. And he still loves us. If we're a believer, he still loves us. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're facing as individuals, as a family, as a father, as a husband, as a wife, as a mother, as a child. 
as his child. He knows these things. He's not stepping afar off saying, okay, well, you live your life on your own. I'm done with you. Is that the way he is? He knows and he cares. So keep seeking him. Keep trusting him. Keep praying to him and keep praising him and asking him to intervene in his time and in his way. And he will. That's where faith comes in. But if you haven't committed your life to Christ, do so today. He created you to know him. And he sent his son to his earth to die for our sins, to die for your sins and mine. And when we trust in him, we become his child. We become his. And though he does spank his children, he does it because he loves us. That's why he disciplines us. So the Son of God took on human flesh to die for our sins. A cruel, heart-wrenching, horrible way to die on the cross. But he didn't stay dead. He physically came back to life three days later. Go, go to Israel today. There's two possible locations of the tomb. Both are empty. Both are empty. He is alive today, and he's coming again. And my friend, if you haven't given your life to, to him, you need to do so. Because when he returns to judge the living and the dead, it may be too late. So giving your life today. If you need a church, you need to be baptized, you can do that here. You can do that here. So with that said, let's pray. Let's pray to the creator of the universe. Our Father and our God, we thank you, we praise you, we worship you, we bow before you. We humble ourselves before you, but because of Christ, we come boldly to your throne of grace, thanking you that you hear us. Thanking that you are trustworthy and faithful and just. We thank you that you forgive us. And Father, I pray that you would, as the body of Christ, we have taken our eyes off of you and put it on so many other things. So Lord, give us an understanding of who you are. Remind us of your power. Because one of the reasons, as we know in the word, your word, that you are spoken of as a creator so often is because of your power. And Lord, we need your power today in the church. In general, but also here at Grace Life. We cannot do anything without you. And we need you, Lord. And Father, for those who have not given their life to Christ, I pray you convict them, pray you bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus by faith alone because of your grace. And I pray that we as believers would remember you as the creator who is bigger than anything that we face, bigger than anything the country or the world will face too. So we come to you and we surrender everything. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. And we pray for your return as well, Lord, in your time and your way. And prepare us for what is coming before that time. So we give this all to you in the mighty name of Jesus, the creator. In his name we pray. Amen.